and uh, welcome to this, our ninth webinar on um, uh, Mongolia tonight, uh, the epic kind of wilderness destination that is Mongolia. My name's Johnny Bealby. I founded Wild Frontiers some 20 odd years ago. And can I first of all just say how exciting it is to have so many people on our webinar tonight. Um, as I say, this is the ninth one that, I, that we've done. Um, and uh, I think the most we've had before was about 350 people on our Silk Road talk. Um, so tonight we have over, God, nearly 600 people and it's still climbing. So that's just wonderful. Um, and I'm sure the main reason for that is not so much me or even Wild Frontiers, but probably because we are so excited tonight to have our guest speaker, um, Benedict Allen, who we will be telling you a little bit more about uh, in a minute. Um, first of all, let me just tell you a little bit about this evening's proceedings. So I will tell you a little bit about the housekeeping of being on the webinar. Then I'll explain a bit about Wild Frontiers uh, before uh, talking in a very general sense about our destination tonight, Mongolia. Um, I'll then hand over to Benedict, who will take you through his epic adventure uh, across the Gobi Desert some, well, nearly 25 years ago now, uh, before handing over to Mark, our Director of Product and Operations, who will then tell you about um, the trips that we run in Mongolia and how you could go there. Yes, this summer, we believe it's going to be possible. So that is quite exciting. Uh, for those of you that are used to watching our webinars, we're going to throw in a little bit of a curveball tonight. We're going to have a couple of polls um, where just to keep you on your toes, where we're going to ask you a couple of questions and you can kind of vote. Um, and uh, we'll also have a Q&A session at the end. So if you've got any questions, please just use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom there. Write your question into any one of us, Mark, uh, about uh, our trips to uh, uh, Mongolia, Benedict about his life as an adventurer, or me about Wild Frontiers or anything else. So do put your questions down. If we don't get round to answering them, we will answer them uh, tomorrow in an email, which we will send out. We are recording tonight's webinar, so we will send that to you as well. So if you want to watch it again, you can. And if you want to send it to your friends, you can do that as well. Um, and that email tomorrow will include a few other bits and bobs that we think are relevant. So without further ado, let me share my screen and I am going to tell you a little bit about Wild Frontiers. So let me tell you about myself, first of all, uh, very good subject, I'm sure. Um, so uh, in the 90s, I did three big journeys. I rode a motorbike around Africa. I walked through parts of India, Pakistan and Afghanistan, and I rode a horse along the Silk Road. Uh, from Kashgar to the Caspian Sea. This resulted in three travel books, Running with the Moon, about the motorcycle journey, for a pagan song about the walk through uh, India, Pakistan and Afghanistan in the footsteps of the man who would be king, and Silk Dream's Troubled Road about the horse ride along uh, the Silk Road. That also became a Discovery Channel film as well. Um, but perhaps more poignantly, what it also led to was the birth of Wild Frontiers. While I was on the second of those journeys in northern Pakistan, I was spending time with a pagan tribe called the Kalash, and the, um, the, the chief spokesperson there, a chap called Saifullah, uh, said, you should start a travel company and bring uh, tourists to come and see us. We would like it, they would like it, it would be a good business to have. And so I took him up on it, and I did, and here we are 20 years later. We now run trips, small group tours, and tailor-made holidays to about 90 destinations worldwide, uh, Indian subcontinent, parts of Africa, parts of Latin America, the Middle East, and of course, Central Asia. Um, and uh, with COVID in mind, last summer, we also started working on some new destinations closer to home. Now, I'm talking now largely to my British audience. Uh, we are a British company and I know we've got people joining us from the States and, and all over Asia as well. Um, but uh, it, it, those of us that are in Britain and kind of rather locked down at the moment um, will know that the rules are that we will hopefully be able to start traveling from May. And uh, we kind of figured that this might be the case and therefore we developed uh, some trips closer to home, which we think will be just great for this summer. So Italy, Turkey, Spain, Poland, Slovakia, Greece, and even Scotland. Um, and I was lucky enough to recce some of these trips at the end of last year. So that gives us all an opportunity to get traveling sooner rather than later, which I'm sure uh, you will all like to hear. Um, so let's talk about Mongolia. Um, that's after all why we're all here. 
So I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on the country um, and then hand over to our, to our main event. So Mongolia, uh, it is 1.5 million square kilometers in size, making it the 18th largest country in the world. And with a population of 3.3 million, it's the second most sparsely populated after Greenland, making it perfect for a socially distanced holiday. Um, it's the world's second largest landlocked country behind Kazakhstan and is the largest landlocked country that doesn't have a closed border. As you can see here, it borders China to the south and Russia to the north, but does have a tiny 100 mile border with Kazakhstan to the west. Um, but of course, primarily, it's a country of wilderness, of the great outdoors, of beautiful, beautiful landscapes and nomadic culture. It's a country of great mountains and deserts, sometimes in the same location. Um, look at that little yurt camp. If you can see that down on the right hand side of your picture, you know, in a few months time, you could be staying there looking at that amazing scene. Uh, it is predominantly a Buddhist country. Buddhism was introduced to Mongolia in the 16th century from Tibet. Um, and a third of the population still are nomadic or semi-nomadic people. Um, and these, uh, cultural um, experiences, the, the, the culture of the nomadic life is very much visible in some of the uh, festivals that they have in Mongolia. This particular festival is, obviously, is the Eagle Festival, which takes place in September. Uh, we have a couple of trips going to that later this year. Um, and of course, with the um, lack of light pollution, you will get to see some pretty phenomenal starry skies. Um, but if you mention the name Mongolia, there's really only one person that immediately comes to mind, and that's this chap, Mr. Genghis or Genghis Khan. Um, now, to most in the West, Genghis Khan and his Mughal hordes were little more than a barbarous rabble that exploded across Asia and into Europe in a murderous blitz, blitzkrieg slaughtering all before them. However, while that narrative uh, does have some justification, it's also true that their conquests led to great improved quality in life of Western civilizations. Um, the empire lasted from 1206 to 1368. It's the second largest empire of all time and covered more continuous landmass than any other, holding sway over some 18 million square kilometers. Um, despite its reputation for brutal warfare, Mongolian empire uh, briefly enabled peace, stability, and trade across much of Eurasia, Eurasia from China to Russia and as far south as Syria and protected travel under a period of Pax Mongolica or Mongol peace, um, beginning in around 1279 and lasting until the empire's end. With this vast region under central authority, travel became much easier and safer than it had been for centuries. This in turn spurred vast increase in trade along the Silk Road. Luxury goods and new technologies spread across Eurasia. Silks and porcelain went from China to Iran. Jewels and beautiful horses traveled back to grace the courts of the Yan dynasty founded by Genghis Khan's grandson, Kublai Khan. And ancient Chinese inventions like gunpowder, paper making, and the printing press made their way, way into medieval Europe, changing the future course of world history. A few things that people don't know that the Mo Mongols invented, let's show you. They invented uh, milk powder. They invented ice cream, kind of rather unintentionally. The, the, the Mongol horsemen uh, used to ride with uh, containers of cream and in kind of frozen winter conditions, it would bounce up and down on their saddles and become ice cream. Um, they also had a, um, a, the Yam postal service, which connected one end of the empire from the other in a series of relo sta uh, relay stations, much like the Pony Express in America many years later and they had passports for their couriers, which is something we use today. Um, but of course, primarily, it was to do with warfare. Um, using the Chinese invention of gunpowder, they actually created the world's first hand grenades, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, they were the first to use a composite bow. Uh, in Europe, most European armies were using just a single piece of wood, um, but the uh, Mongols had a composite bow made of wood, bone, and sinew. Uh, uh, at, which were much more accurate and could fire much further distances. They also hollowed out some of their arrows to give a terrifying squeal as the arrows flew through the air. And the stirrups, which they invented, which coupled with this uh, great archery skill, made, of course, their cavalry such a feared war machine. 
Um, but it wasn't just people that moved along the Silk Road. It was also animals and tiny little fleas uh, bringing the bubonic plague. Uh, the disease probably broke out in Western China in around 1330 and hit Europe in around 1346. Uh, altogether, the Black Death probably killed around 25% of Asia, uh, population of Asia, and around 50% of Europe's population. And this catastrophic depopulation, uh, along with political fragmentation of Mongolian Empire, led to the breakdown of Pax Mongolica. Sorry, there is another picture of them doing it today, which you would see at one of the Eagle Festivals. Um, so after that, uh, Mongolia fell back into its nomadic feudal infighting, was absorbed by the Buddhist Qing dynasty in the 17th century. It broke away from China in the early 20th century to become the Mongolian People's Republic, harboring close links to the USSR and gained full independence after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1990. It now has a multi-party system, a new constitution and a market economy. However, before we go on, I'm just going to tell you a very briefly about the situation today in relation to COVID, because whenever we do these webinars, this is something we often get asked about. So as you might kind of imagine, given the scarceness of the population um, and the lack of density of the population, uh, Mongolia has handled COVID pretty well. Um, according to John Hopkins, University, they have had 2,732 cases and two deaths. Uh, this week saw them start their vaccination program. They are hoping to vaccinate 2 million of the population by June. And according to our partners in Mongolia, they will open to tourists at the end of June or early July. And we have trips running from August. So there we are. That is a little bit of background on Mongolia. Now I'm going to do our first poll. I've never done this before, so just bear with me. Uh, here we go. I'm going to launch it. Now all you have to do is um, pick one. You can actually pick more than one if you want. How do you feel about visiting Mongolia? I have already been. I'm booked to go. I would like to go one day. I can't see myself ever visiting Mongolia. I hope that one doesn't get too many um, ticks. Um, I'm just going to leave that running for, let's say, another 10 seconds. Um, oh, look at this. I like this. This is great. Yep. That's almost everybody has voted. That's fantastic. Okay, let's end the poll and let's share the results. There you go. So um, 118 of you have already been. That's fantastic. Good for you. I'm booked to go. Five of you. I hope that's with Wild Frontiers. Um, and 455 say you would love to go one day with 15 saying you don't really see yourself visiting. Well, that's all right, because um, we hope we can entertain you anyway. So that's good. I'm going to stop sharing that. And now we're going to uh, crack on. So let me move on now to our main guest. Uh, author, adventurer, filmmaker, our special guest tonight established himself as one of the world's leading explorers through explorations uh, to remote indigenous communities famously achieved not with a phone, GPS or backup, but by preparation alone. Dispensing with a film crew, he went on to pioneer recording of extreme journeys for TV on his own, showing the way to people like Bear Grylls, Leveson Wood, and to a lesser extent, myself. Um, Benedict has published 12 books, recorded six BBC series and a number of others for the History Channel and National Geographic. He's a trustee at the Royal Geographical Society. And this is what he has to say about adventure. For me personally, exploration isn't about conquering nature, planting flags and leaving your mark. It's about the opposite, opening yourself up and allowing the place to leave its mark on you. I couldn't have put it better myself. Ladies and gentlemen, here uh, joining us all the way from Prague, at least I hope he is, Benedict, ah, here we go. Hey, ah, all the way from Prague is <laughs> Benedict Allen. Good evening, Benedict. Uh, good evening. Yes, uh, my big worry was the technology because as Johnny, you say, uh, I tend to leave it all behind or at least just take a camera and a few, few little things to record my journey. Uh, but for me, it's about leaving what I've come from behind and immersing myself. Not always very possible, but um, anyway, that's that's what I try and do. So I've, uh, I've shoved my children next door. I put a mattress against the door to try and block them out. Um, Hopefully you can hear me from Prague. I don't know where you are in the world, but um, it, it's funny to, uh, talking about technology or my lack of adeptness with technology. 
I and I'm reminded of a time in Shepherd's Bush. I used to live in Shepherd's Bush. It, it, frankly, it's a bit of a dodgy area <laughs> in West London. I, I mean, not if you live there, obviously. But uh, anyway, back then, long, long time ago, say 25 years ago, 1997, there I was. I was queuing at a cash point machine, and I thought, right, just get the cash out from this cash point machine. There's, there was several people in front of me, maybe three, four people. And the woman right at the front of the queue was having real trouble with her card. She kept on putting it in and the machine would reject it with a sort of noise, a grinding noise. Finally, the machine swallowed her card and she turned around to the rest of us waiting patiently in the queue and said, oh, I might as well be in Outer Mongolia. And that struck me as quite interesting. I thought, oh, Outer Mongolia, I wonder what really does happen out there. It's rather like Timbuktu. I think Outer Mongolia represents for us the back of beyond, the middle of nowhere. And I began thinking about this. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I could ever launch an expedition there to find out what really this place was all about. So hopefully now I can start showing you. Uh, yeah, hooray. This, this is, well, it's not the entire result of my expedition. Uh, <laughs> it's the first bit of it. I just want to give you a sense of this journey that I finally did, 1997. And this particular image I'm interested by because, uh, well, one thing was, I was hoping this, this herdsman who was traveling across this majestic landscape with this horse, I just thought, yes, my luck is in. If I get the timing right, I can take this photo just as the horse passes in front of this uh, reflection on the pool and I'll see him perfectly and it'd be in this lovely photo. Anyway, unfortunately, the pool was slightly smaller than I was hoping and is only half reflected. But you get the idea. This is a sort of landscape that you imagine Genghis Khan, Chinggis Khan would have understood. This is perhaps how we think of as Mongolia today as well. A place of rolling step plans and open landscapes and all rather verdant. The truth is more like this. Eight months of the year, Mongolia is locked in a fearsome winter. The Mongolians call it the killing season. Eight months of the year, uh, temperatures down to maybe minus 40 uh, or even lower than that in the Gobi Desert down in the south. Uh, there's this bloke I got to know a little bit later. This is on my recce trip, not the main expedition, but I reckoned that I'd have about four months in the year in which to do a journey across this landscape, the bit of the year that wasn't the killing season. This bloke, is a uh, man called Dundo, he's a Kazakh, and he's chopping out ice from the river in order just to have something to drink. So that's how harsh it could be. But as Johnny said, a huge proportion of Mongolia is still nomadic. And this is very exciting to me. In those days, 1997, 40% of the population, now just a little bit less than that, still reliant on their herds of yaks like these, uh, but also obviously horses, camels and so on, to navigate this landscape. And I thought, wow, this is what I've got to try and understand. What about trying to do a journey with animals, with livestock? And I set my mind to acquiring some animals. This is a pretty bad map, but it gives you the idea of where Mongolia is placed. I was going to start my journey right up there in the far north into that bumpy bit sticking into Siberia. So this is geographically a Siberian uh, climate, uh, very, very cold up in the north, mountainous. I was going to head up there to try and understand a little bit of that colder mountainous landscape down into the central steppes, round to the west, the Al Altai Mountains, which is the Kazakh area, and then cut across the Gobi Desert, which extends right along the southern border with China. Gobi Desert was going to take me, well, I didn't know, but uh, certainly uh, six weeks or so, maybe two months. And all of this journey would have to be within that window, the four month window I'd allow myself um, if I wasn't going to get frozen on either side, if you see what I mean. So four months to do a journey that was going to be something like 3000 miles and um, a little bit worrying. I had to get everything absolutely ready for the uh, beginning of June, essentially. So camels, brilliant. I thought I'll get myself some camels. So I started off in the Gobi Desert and there was one camel I had an eye on. I thought this is this is going to be a good one. It, it was huge. You can see him there, sort of two thirds of the way along, a, a big camel. Uh, I, I nicknamed him Top Camel. I was sure he was going to be my top camel. I wanted three. And um, anyway, I had my eye on this camel. 
and the herders desperately tried to get him out, but he was a clever camel. He decided he wasn't going to be rounded up for anyone. He stayed in the middle of this bunch of hairy beasts, his mates, and I find it very difficult. Well, I, I actually I wasn't doing anything. I was just standing here with the camera, but uh, the locals find it very difficult to hoik him out. Uh, the only camel I could get anywhere near uh, was this one. Um, <laughs> oh dear, I don't know why I'm laughing. Uh, the, the, the locals certainly were laughing at me. It was, it was a very young camel, um, rather deluded. Um, and the, the locals thought it was funny because they said, I must have the knees of a camel. I've got very long legs. I don't think my knees are particularly knobbly, but the locals somehow did. And uh, they decided this camel was confused and thought I was his dad. Um, anyway, got over that incident, finally rounded up uh, three camels. And here they are. So. Uh, Top camel, TC, as I called him, he's on the right. He's ridden by Kermit. Kermit was going to be uh, with me for much of the journey, not in the Gobi, but leading this preparation period that would take probably three and a half months as I journeyed around the North Mongolia and finally down the Altai, lining myself up for the Gobi crossing alone. And so, yeah, Kermit, I should explain about Kermit. Kermit, well, let me just say, I uh, knew he was riding alongside because he could hear the clink clink of his vodka bottles. Uh, he was that sort of person. Um, anyway, he was very good at, with his horses as well as his drinking, and um, he was a good trusty companion. Didn't speak a word of English, but that was good because I had to learn not just the skills of Mongolians or some of them, how they handled animals uh, and how they handled the landscape, but also I had to be able to communicate. So this was an intensive course. I'd already gone through five teachers, I should say, in despair. Mongolian is not, not one of the world's easiest languages. But anyway, we were proceeding now out of the Gobi Desert. Kermit was going to fatten the animals up while I made my way north to get some horses. Yeah, uh, this gives you a bit of an idea of how different the landscape is. And this is part of what's so exciting about Mongolia. It's so varied. And uh, here, right up in Hoof School, the northern area of Mongolia. And um, yeah, you see the larch forests and so on. And um, I began trying to get to know the horses. My plan was to ride horses and camels would be baggage animals. The horses were quite extraordinary. Mongolia, of course, is famous for its horses and justly so. These animals are left out in that winter. Remember, it's the killing season without blankets, without forage, without anything else, just left on their own. They become semi wild every winter. They have to be uh, wild, as it were, in order just to look around for food. They've got very powerful feet and they paw the ground uh, to try and eat roots and so on. So, tough, tough animals. This is actually reindeer country. Uh, this little girl called Sitset, like, um, uh, she, she was wonderful. She used to guide me around with a, a reindeer. Uh, her, her granny was a, a shaman and she agreed to go in, into a trance, talk to the spirits. And um, this is her, actually, well, she's her drinking tea, actually. <laughs> um, tea's a great thing in Mongolia. Just, just think of it as soup, because Mongolians put salt in it. Uh, <laughs> Forget it's tea, it's just better if you think of it as soup. Uh, great liquid, by the way, just because it's a, a great rehydrator. If you have a bit of salt and uh, sugar in your tea, it rehydrates you. So very good for this dry landscape. Anyway, there she is, Sent, the shaman. She went into a trance state. Uh, you can see her there in the background uh, with a headdress on of crow feathers. The crow was her shamanic animal that would help lift her into the spirit world as she beat the drums and prayed to Tengur. Tengur is the sky god. Um, the all-powerful sky god. Remember this killing weather, this powerful uh, landscape that can do you in and your livestock. So you've got to be on good terms with Tenga. And throughout these photos and the photos you've seen from Johnny, you'll, you'll notice these immense blue skies. So Tenga is always represented in blue. You can see in her dress there, in her outfit, a blue representing Tenga. So she talked to Tenga and asked for a blessing. And um, I duly received it and uh, then um, started to get on with the journey. Um, again, I couldn't help noticing that the locals were sort of laughing uh, as I went by. And this was, um, I decided, because uh, I was told several times, 
because I was too tall for the local horses. You can see the center of gravity on this horse is, is sort of somewhere up, well, above the head pretty well of this horse. Um, and I always thought the horse would just sort of keel over, you know, with my height. So the horse, Mongolian horse is very, very short. Um, I'm very long and uh, my feet were often trailing in the grass. Anyway, nonetheless, I was learning skills uh, day by day. Reunited with Kermit, uh, and uh, oh, he's not, he's not drinking here. That's great. Uh, crossing rivers, crossing cliffs, moving towards the camels that were sitting now waiting, and I couldn't help but be impressed by these extraordinary animals. In the end, I was to ride two thousand miles with Mongolian horses till I got to the Gobi Desert, and the horses didn't stumble once in two thousand miles. Can you imagine something like three thousand kilometers? Uh, quite extraordinary animals, resilient but also sturdy and agile. Well, I uh, finally got to the place where the camels were and uh, we were given a little bit of a send off by some, some locals in their gears or yurts as the Russians would say. And uh, it just happened to be rather bad luck actually. Uh, the locals decided to up sticks at the same time that we launched off. And so we found ourselves humiliated, me and Kermit, because they just did it in about an hour. Can you imagine packing up all your possessions within one hour? So this is one of the gears, one of the tents, felt tents being taken down. You can see in the middle there, there's a little lady. She was casually making tea for her team, her family, who were dismantling their house in just a few moments. And um, we were still sort of struggling with our first knots as, as they managed to get themselves totally organized and, uh, well, off they went. Um, <laughs> Kermit desperately trying to teach me what he could. And um, yeah, it was, it was going very, very slowly. We had to learn the slow way. Well, at least obviously I had to. Hard for Kermit because most things, if I go back one slide, you'll see there's two men putting on the baggage onto that camel. Uh, you need two men to load a camel. And uh, well, that was gonna raise a problem for me later on the journey because I was gonna be alone. But for Kermit, hard to work with someone like me who was a total beginner. But learning was what the journey was all about. And off we went through this extraordinary landscape. As I said earlier, it's a landscape that Genghis Khan, Chinggis Khan himself would have known. And we were traveling in a way that he would have understood as well. And I found that incredibly exciting. This wasn't a gimmicky journey. It didn't seem ridiculous to the locals that we were traveling by horseback and with camel behind, it seemed like something they would do too. And that was a glorious feeling. So there I am in the front, uh, Kermit number three. We had a string of horses actually, uh, which we changed, three camels at the back carrying the bags. And supported all the way by the Mongolians. As Johnny was saying, incredibly sparsely populated are the plains of Mongolia and the mountains and the desert but it's the locals who keep everyone going. It's like a sort of uh, super social security network. If you need help, you go to your neighbor. He might've moved, uh, but he'd be out there somewhere. And time and time again, we would go past the gears. And you'll see this if you ever get to Mongolia, or perhaps you've experienced it yourself, the hospitality, hospitality of the Mongolians is quite remarkable. You don't knock on the door, of a gear, you walk straight in. I mean, to me, that'd be a bit horrific. Um, <laughs> but the Mongolians uh, think it's uh, totally normal. You just walk in as a stranger into someone else's house. And you go in and you're invited to sit uh, towards the uh, far end, towards the altar, the most holy, I suppose you could say, or the most prestigious place in the gear. And you're given a salty cup of tea and hopefully something more to eat. Uh, curds and whey or, or something else, mutton usually, frankly, um, <laughs> and that can get a bit, um, uh, well, it gets a little bit dull after three or four months just eating mutton. But nonetheless, uh, that was the hospitality that was given you, and wonderful. Uh, I can't underline this enough. Whether you're someone as highly favoured or with such high status as the president, or if you're me, a foreigner who's bumbling along, you're given exactly the same treatment. And this is very interesting because Mongolians are seen as having this legacy of barbarism. You know, Chinggis Khan, the, the man who's done more to lay waste to Europe um, than any single individual, perhaps. Um, well, there are other tyrants, of course, but uh, anyway, he did a lot of damage. And, uh, and yet, here was this civilization. I found it absolutely wonderful. 
face to face over a cup of tea, you'd exchange greetings and there was this wonderful sense of humanity. You're all in it together. And I love that about Mongolia and I miss it hugely. Anyway, on we went through this landscape. Um, and uh, yeah, th this is another thing that hasn't changed since um, the, the time of Genghis Khan, I suppose. Uh, the great festival of the horses. The horses are still so important to the Mongolians. There's a lovely feeling when you're in Ulaanbaatar or any of the other urban areas, people are still very proud of their roots right out in the countryside. A lot of countries, perhaps most countries in the world, people don't regard the people out in the countryside as, as very wonderful, really. They think they're out in the sticks, not in Mongolia. In Mongolia, people are proud of their roots. And so this is a nardum on the, the festivals. Uh, these ladies are waiting for the end of a horse race, all done up. Uh, I should say I took this photo and I was almost trampled to death as all these keen young ladies raced, not towards me, I should say, but uh, towards the finishing post, which unfortunately was behind me. So um, that was almost the end of me, but uh, you can sense the pride uh, in, and joy and skill of these women. Uh, this was a wonderful moment of these two boys neck and neck, and at the last minute, this rather cool character managed to get to the winning post, uh, the one in blue, and um, infuriating for the one behind. I thought, oh, poor bloke, he was gonna win and he was robbed. Uh, but look, they not they haven't got stirrups, they haven't even got shoes, these boys. Uh, they haven't got a saddle. Uh, look at this skill, so moving. A lot of children, even now, uh, learn to ride a horse before they can learn to walk. Uh, so absolutely extraordinary. I always wondered about that boy behind and, and his uh, the horror of having this victory snatched from him. Anyway, uh, time went by. Um, Oh, uh, <laughs> Kermit's got his bottle of Chinggis Khan vodka, Genghis Khan vodka, um, his sort of staple food. Actually, I'm being a bit un unkind to Kermit. Um, but anyway, he's gathering himself together at one of our little pit stops along this uh, long journey. I suppose three and a half months had gone by now. We're starting to get ourselves orientated towards the desert, a different change of uh, terrain. And um, for this photo, I had to prop uh, Kermit up between two other people. <laughs> He's had a rather long night, if you know what I mean. He's a bit green in the face, but anyway, I managed to make the photo work um, by shoving him in between the two other people, and he looks sort of competent. What we're actually doing is putting on solar panels on the horses because I was trying to film the whole thing. And um, it, uh, yeah, well, I thought you liked that technical <laughs> information. I needed power, obviously, as I carried on like a nomad, as the locals did. So now the Gobi Desert. I changed camels, and I, you might notice in this photo these th two men are—they're looking well. They're looking very proud. This is a big, big moment. The, the camels have got sashes on, blue sashes representing Tengur, the sky god. So they've been given a blessing by their owners, as I am given the reins of these camels. My three camels are very, very proud, and the men were very proud. You, you see the ceremony here of course exchanging of, of livestock is central to the nomad's life very very important moments and these are very dignified occasions but you might also notice that these two men are slightly smirking and the reason why they're smirking is that i have just bought the three dodgiest camels in the whole of the gobi desert uh, the one on the left uh, he was called bastion well i called him bastion uh, <laughs> because bastion means something big and powerful. And I thought, well, he's a big, powerful animal. I'll call him Bastion. Anyway, it turns out uh, I put the BBC tripod on him and he sort of wilted under the weight. It was only made out of plastic, this thing. And I thought, oh no, he's like one of those muscular characters who, uh, who doesn't, isn't very strong. Anyway, I thought, oh, at least he's better than the next camel. Next camel was Jijik. Uh, that means small in Mongolia, if you didn't know that. Now you do. Uh, anyway, he was small in Mongolia, but he had one of these big brains. Um, and you don't want too clever a camel with you, as I was about to discover. Uh, he was already looking at the bushes. You can see he was sort of working out escape routes uh, or at least places he could have a little snack along the way. But at least he was better than the next camel. You can't really see him, but it, it's pretty typical of him. Bert, I called him. He only, um, he only had one hump I couldn't help noticing. The, the local camels are meant to have two, they're battering camels. And I uh, also couldn't help noticing he only had one eye. But I thought at least he'll stick with me, perhaps, if the others don't. 
And then in my walking into the desert, you can see the landscape changing now. I'm walking beside uh, Jijik uh, because I thought he's the clever camera. I've got to bond with him, make sure he doesn't get up to any of his tricks. And uh, there's Bert in the middle, the one-eyed camel, one-humped camel. And um, there's Bastian carrying absolutely nothing on the outside. Uh, that, that, that says it all, really. And it was to, seemed to be repeated every day. He didn't really like carrying stuff. Um, I mean, you can see he's got a rifle. That was in case of wolves. Um, they just might spook the camels, spook the horses. Horses, meanwhile, getting more and more restless as we enter this arid landscape. Again, look at that scene. To me, absolutely beautiful as the step plans disappeared and now the stands are spread. There's a wild asses. There are scenes like this all over the place. It's such an exquisite landscape. It's a landscape in which your mind sort of expands. Uh, somehow you feel so at peace walking day after day or riding day after day through it. This is my farewell to Kermit. Uh, he's going to leave me now. And I... Uh, yeah, well, I was saying goodbye. So I was leaning against Jijik because I thought I've got to impress him. This is my last chance to, that's why I've still got reinforcements with Kermit around. I've got to make myself, um, well, just just be, uh, yeah, make myself known to him at least because uh, he didn't seem to be listening to me very much. And now the moment when I set off into the desert by myself, this is the last photo you know, took as I headed off. And um, as usual, Bastian is carrying absolutely nothing. And uh, yeah, this landscape, this is ooh, maybe a week had gone by, I hadn't seen any humans. Uh, things going pretty well, but I was getting a little bit worried, worried about Jijik. Um, and um, then I came to this landscape. This is after two weeks of not seeing anyone. And I was standing there at Jijik thinking, oh dear, this looks a bit like the moon, this. Ooh. Anyway, Jijik was clearly thinking to himself, oh dear, this looks like the moon. And um, there and then he went on strike. And he sat down and this is the photo I took at the time, a very dangerous moment actually, because if Jijik decided not to carry on, then there's very little I could do about it. The camels don't need humans, they're, they're built for the desert, obviously. They've also got a photographic memory. I knew he'd memorized the journey here and any minute he was just gonna walk off. So I took off his pack, tried to make things easier for him. And I thought, right, I'll put my cunning plan into action. And I pretended to head home. As I said, camels have, have, they have a photographic memory. And off I went back towards the west. And he looked very pleased with this. He was walking along. And I gradually, gradually, gradually moved around in a semicircle to head east the way I wanted to go. And he realized that he'd been tricked. And there and then he grew absolutely furious. He dug his feet into the sand and he just wouldn't shift. He began roaring at me. And it was a moment of uh, total crisis and fear. I thought I'm just gonna die out here unless I control the situation. And there and then I had to walk off with the other two camels. And, and that's what I did. Um, and that's why I'm with you here today. Um, don't worry about Jijik, by the way, um, the traitor Jijik. Um, <laughs> he just walked back and he was seen three weeks later, the place he'd arrived at. Um, it's, he was faster than when he left, according to the owners. So uh, he was fine. Anyway, I was still worrying about my two camels, whether they would stick with me, and they did. Ah, poor old Bert. Um, Bert had to carry everything now. Even in my moment of need, Bastian wouldn't carry a thing. But at least he stuck with me, and that, I suppose, reassured Bert, and we carried on through the desert. I'll have to cut the story uh, short, but because uh, it went on for six weeks of this, <laughs> me trudging through the desert with my camels. And I, I just want to show you this photo because it's, it's remarkable to me. I was in the middle of nowhere, so I thought. And I was very rarely seeing humans. And suddenly there was this girl on the landscape, probably only eight, nine years old, but she was totally at home with her camel that she would have brought up, been brought up with. She would have nurtured this animal, it's probably about her age, and there she was, master of this scenery, and uh, she invited me in, and I met her dad and her family in their remote gear, and they looked after me, as so many other people had through this desert and through this landscape of Mongolia, uh, but it was such a reminder that the Mongolians have the tools to this landscape, and they're such amazing guides. They're so hospitable. They 
will invite you into this place and enable you to see it in a way that's hospitable and not as a sort of dreaded place. Uh, there I am actually with her dad drinking more salted tea. I sort of got used to the salted tea. My stomach hadn't quite attuned itself to the joys of eating mutton every day. But nonetheless, uh, I was staggering along and uh, uh, so absorbed um, in the landscape now and in this culture. Benedict, have we lost you? Uh, um, it seems as though the internet connection has gone down with Prague um, a little bit frustratingly. Um, I will hope that we will get Benedict back in due course, um, but perhaps in the meantime, we should uh, crack on with um, Mark and talk about the, uh, the, 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 the trips that Wild Frontiers run there. Um, I think I, I, I can't see Benedict uh, back on at the moment. So um, I think we'd better do that. Mark, are you around? Are you, uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, I was just enjoying, do you want to do the poll? But just oh yeah, good idea. Let's, let's, another let's, couple of minutes. Absolutely, let's do the next poll. That's a very good, 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 good point. So let's just do that. So here you go. What, oh, I haven't launched it yet. Here we go. Uh, what is your main reason for joining this webinar this evening? We think it's multiple choice, but I've had a couple of people say perhaps it's not. So. You're a big fan of Benedict and wanted to hear him speak, so I'm sorry that he's been cut off. Um, I'm a big fan of Wild Frontiers and have tuned in to previous webinars. I'm fascinated by Mongolia. <laughs> I was a bit bored and didn't have anything else to do. So fire away. Let's give that a few, a few minutes and just see how many people we get answering those. Okay, I think that's probably... Good, let's end poll. Okay, so we'll share the results. And uh, that's great. I mean, I think Benedict will be happy with having 82 fans on board. Um, we're certainly happy with having lots of people that, uh, that, that zoom into our webinars, which is great. Uh, and people fascinated by Mongolia. So that's really good. Uh, good to see. <laughs> and good to see that only 18 people were bored with nothing much else to do tonight. Um, so good, let's get rid of that. Um, so Mark, um, Mark is our head of uh, uh, product and operations and his task tonight is to tell you about the Wild Frontiers trips in Mongolia. Um, so Mark, I I'll hand over to you. Fine, well, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you happen to be in the world. And yeah, I will talk you through what there is to see and do in Mongolia. And before I start, I think it's just worth saying that with Mongolia, unlike a lot of other destinations that you might find around, there are really kind of no must-see sites and, and must-see experiences. And, you know, there's no Taj Mahal. You know, there's no safaris with herds of wildebeest traveling across the plains. You know, there are no mountain trails going to lost cities and there are no vineyards offering wine tasting and gastronomy tours. But with that actually lends itself to an incredibly liberating experience. It means that one, there's actually less of a tourist circuit than you often find in some other countries. And it means that while the country is incredibly varied, as I think you've seen from even just some of Benedict's photographs, it also means that you don't really have to go to any particular place. You're kind of free depending on what season you go, what your interests are. And there's so much about Mongolia that really just being there is half the experience. But it is a big country. You know, it is six times the size of the UK and more than twice the size of Texas. So you're not going to be able to get to travel everywhere. So when you're trying to choose where you want to go, it's first of all worth about thinking about how you want to travel. And I think when it comes to how you want to travel, you've got four main options. And option one is what I call the Ala Benedict's choice. And this is very easy. 
this you just go you get yourself a camel and off you go now if you want to do that you're more than welcome to wild frontiers unfortunately probably can't help you very much but you're more than welcome to come and join us in a couple of years time and join us on another webinar presentation and hopefully with a better internet connection than benedict is having at the moment option two is to take one of our small group tours now for those of you that don't know most of our small group tours have a maximum group size of 12 with an average group size of nine and we refresh them every few years uh, making sure that they are you know delivering what we want to deliver and at the moment we have two very distinct itineraries for Mongolia and I'm going to talk you through both of them just to give you an idea of the types of things that you can do if you want to join one of those tours so this is the first one it's called Land of the Great Khan. It's a 13 day trip and it can just about be um, op operated between May and September. Again, as Benedict was saying, there is a fairly limited season um, in Mongolia. And this trip really tries to give you a little bit of the variety that Mongolia has, you know, from the capital down to the Gobi in the south, out into the desert, across the grassland steppes, into some of the mountain territory, and then taking in some of the culture aspects as well. So what does that trip look like in practice? So it does start in Ulaanbaatar. UB, as it's effectively known, actually has 45% of the country's population, but it's a surprisingly cosmopolitan place. I know when I first there, I was quite surprised just how many foreigners there were there. And I think that's partly due to the fact that there's a lot of mineral wealth in Mongolia. So it has attracted people from all over the world. So that's what you'll find in UB. It's worth noting that there are no direct flights to Mongolia from England, from, you know, from the UK, from the US, from Australia, New Zealand. So these are your main carriers for flying into UB. But there is another way, if you've got more time, you can actually take the train all the way to Ulaanbaatar. Now, most people have heard of the Trans-Siberian, and as you can see here in red, that takes you all the way from Moscow, right the way over to Vladivostok. But if you go about two thirds of the way along, you'll see Lake Bakul and Ulan Ude, and then an orange line coming off of the red line, that is the Trans-Mongolian, and that goes all the way to Beijing, and as you can see, goes through Ulaanbaatar. So you do need a few days at hand, but if you have got the time, it's quite a, a popular way for getting to or from Mongolia. And UB itself, while it's not going to be the highlight of your trip to Mongolia, it's got enough things there to make for a really interesting kind of first stop. You've got the, um, the Winter Palace. This was built at the end of the 19th century. It was the home of the last Mongolian king, and now it's a museum. You've got the Gandan Monastery. This is the most important monastery um, that you'll find in Mongolia. And it's because the Mongolians actually adhere to a Tibetan form of Buddhism. It's almost like having a, a little bit of Tibet right there in the center of the city. And this is probably one of my favorite places in Ulaanbaatar. It's called Zaisan, and it's a memorial that was built in the 50s, um, very kind of Soviet in its feel, um, kind of socialist realism. Um, and it was there built to commemorate all the Mongolians that died during the Second World War. And what makes it so special is not just the, 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 the mosaics and the reliefs, which I love, but the fact that it's on this incredible hill, which looks out right over the whole of the city. And it's a really popular place for people to go for, for locals to go for wedding photographs and this is one of our groups photobombing a Mongolian wedding, but happily photobombing um, with, with be, being welcomed as well. And then in the evening, we usually go to a, a kind of evening of folklore. Now, I have to admit, that's usually the type of thing that sends shivers down my spine and I run a million miles from. But the one in Mongolia is excellent. But the dancing that you'll see um, bears quite a strong relation to kind of Buddhist stuff, which you may well have seen in Ladakh or in Bhutan. The music is excellent. Mongolia has its own musical tradition and you can see the instruments here. These are called horse head fiddles um, and it's quite unique to Mongolia. And then probably one of the most famous forms of Mongolian art is Mongolian throat singing. Now you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to try and give you a rendition of Mongolian throat singing, but if you've never heard it, it is quite an incredible um, thing to hear. So it's really just kind of an hour, hour and a half, but it's a really, really interesting kind of first evening in Mongolia. Anyway, leaving the capital, we jump on a flight about an hour south and we head down to 
This is actually part of the Gobi. And it's not all desert. Um, this part of the Gobi is called the Yul Valley, um, which means the Eagle Valley. Good chances of seeing eagles here, as well as creatures like this. This is called a pika, which is a, a, a small mammal with no tail and very, very round ears. And this valley is quite famous. We go, as you go for a walk here, even in the middle of summer, you can see deep ice right in the depths of the canyon. And this is where you will then spend your first night in a gur. And one of the things for me about Mongolia that makes it so special is that this is how you will predominantly be sleeping. And it's great. It's how the locals sleep. And if you've been to Kyrgyzstan, these are a more comfortable version of what you find in Kyrgyzstan. Generally here, they're large enough that you can have you know, double or twin share. You can even have single supplements, which will get you your own girl. And I don't know if you've traveled through places like China, you'll find wonderful kind of you know, four star accommodation throughout the entire country. But usually you're a little bit boring. That's you don't get in Mongolia. This is how it works. Yes, you've got shared bathroom facilities and shared kind of dining facilities. But just for the location alone, you're in some of the most stunning places. Um, and inside each yurt, each gur that you stay in will have its own unique style, but there'll be a familiarity. And really, after a couple of nights, you'll become very familiar with the routine. Anyway, once we leave there, we go into a place called Bayanzog, also known as the Flaming Cliffs. Now, here in the 1920s, they did some very important excavation work, and it was here that they found in Asia the very first dinosaur eggs and bones in this part of the world. A lot of the excavation was done by this gentleman, Roy Chapman Andrews, who was an American paleontologist um, who was a real adventurer. Not only did he come to Mongolia for this excavation, he traveled in Borneo, he traveled in Burma, he traveled in China, and is said to be the inspiration for none other than Indiana Jones. And even if you go to Bayanzog today, you will find evidence of these dinosaur bones around the place, but it is absolutely prohibited, not just frowned upon, prohibited to take kind of bones out of the country. Uh, but a great, great place to start the journey into the Gobi. And then from there, we jump in the four wheel drives and we head westward. So going in a, the opposite direction from which Benedict was traveling, heading into some of the amazing sand dunes here. These are the Horgin Ells sand dunes that rise up to two, three hundred meters and here there's just time just to, to go for a walk to take a camel ride and really just to explore this wonderful scenery and realistically for most people that come to the south this is really about as far as they normally get a lot of people don't get beyond Bayanzog or the Yul Valley but we continue further westwards out to this incredible place called the Zulgani Oasis and there's this Khamensov Canyon um, that literally you find almost no one there and we go for a whole day of you know walking and exploring and pretty much complete solitude then we head north and as we head north, we're going across the incredible grasslands. And this is really one of the, the, the iconic sites of Mongolia. And if people then say, OK, well, what do you do on these days when you're traveling? It's quite hard to answer because, you know, nomads don't really adhere to schedules. I can't say, oh, on day eight at three o'clock in the afternoon, you're probably going to be doing this. It really is a much more free form experience. Often you're not on roads, you're on tracks. Sometimes the tracks change from season to season. And really you just being there and coming across what you find and being spontaneous is all part of the joy of being in Mongolia. You'll definitely come across these ovus, which are the, the, the kind of shamanistic um, rock piles, which you'll find dotted throughout the country. And for good luck, you'll always stop. And um, the drivers will usually put a stone or something around the rock and you'll walk around a couple of two, three times um, for good luck. Um, and sometimes they're quite ornate. Sometimes they're a little bit more um, haphazard, but you'll see these throughout the entire country. But what you'll definitely find are the Mongolians, you know, with their herds of goats and sheep and yaks. And as you come across these communities, uh, as Benedict was saying, the door is always open, both physically and metaphorically. And you'll come inside and you'll meet the family and you'll hold a baby and you can play games with the kids. And it's very relaxed. It's very welcoming. Um, and in addition to tea, salty tea, um, you will also almost certainly be offered IRAG. 
Now, Iraq is fermented mare's milk. If you've been to Kyrgyzstan, you'll know it as kumis, and it is warm and fizzy, and it is an acquired taste, but um, it is very, very much kind of part of that hospitality that you'll get on arrival in Mongolia. And this is probably a kind of a good opportunity for me to talk about food. Now, Benedict touched on it, and it is worth saying that food in Mongolia, well, let's just say veganism didn't originate in Mongolia. Um, it is very much based around the limitations of the land, so very much it is animal-based. You'll find a lot of dairy-based products, the IRAG, the fermented mare's milk, um, normal milk, yogurt, and what you can see here in the top right, that is cheese, this very kind of hard cheese you will definitely be offered. And you will be also offered, oh, going the wrong way, you will also be offered meat um, in quantities. So meat and cheese, you're all good for. However, Mongolia does also have a history of tourism for many years, and it is much better connected now with other countries. So you will find vegetables, you will find Chinese influence, you will find Western influence, and especially in the bigger cities like Ulaanbaatar, yes, you've pretty much got a much wider variety of food available. So I would say it's like a lot of Central Asian countries, you're not going to go there for the gastronomic delight that it offers, but you'll eat very well and probably a lot better than you might otherwise imagine. So do not worry about the food. From there, we head from the grasslands to the Orhon Valley. Now, the Orhon Valley is actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of its culture. This was where Genghis Khan, I call him Genghis Khan, um, founded his capital in 1220. Um, it was called Karakorum, today it's called Kharkhorin, um, and back in the day when Marco Polo supposedly visited, um, there were huge, wonderful, ornate palaces. But Genghis's grandson, Kublai Khan, moved the capital after only about 40 years to Beijing. And because of that, the whole area was allowed to be abandoned and eventually it was destroyed and then remade in the 16th century into what you can see here, which is the Erden Zoo Monastery. Now, it suffered quite badly during the Stalinist purges, but today it is a living, thriving Tibetan Buddhist monastery um, and a really great place to visit. And the last place on this trip before we end back in the capital, UB, is a place called Hustai National Park. And it is special because it is home to the largest collection of wild horses in the world. These are called the tacky wild horses, and they're considered to be the only wild horses. There are 380 of them here in the park. They were extinct in the wild. They were reintroduced in the 1990s and to, they are thriving and doing very well. And this is the only place where they are in their natural habitat. And they attract people from all over, including A-listers such as Julia Roberts. Don't know if any of you remember, but this was 2000. She did a, a PBS special about the wild horses of Mongolia, where she lived with a Mongolian family um, for several weeks in order to Jesse, discover their love of horses, which she shared. And I remember her saying that there was no toilet or no bathroom and my mother refusing that Julia Roberts would do something like that. Um, but there you go, she did, and that's her around Hustine National Park. So that's the first trip, Land of the Great Khan. The second trip is completely different. It is over in the west of the country, and it's in the Altai Mountains. Now, the, the Altai Mountains straddle four countries, as you can see here, Mongolia, Russia, Kazakhstan, and China. And ethnically, it is much more Kazakh than Mongolian. Kazakh is the culture, it's the language um, that you'll find around here. And not only has it got stunning scenery, but the main reason for coming here, that we go here, is for the Eagle Hunting Festival that happens every September. Now, a little bit of background about the Eagle Hunting Festival. The eagle hunting that the Kazakhs do is something that has been going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And in 2011, it was inscribed by UNESCO as a, a kind of humanity, um, kind of cultural heritage thing. And the way that it works is from a very um, young age, the eaglets are taken from the nests. Often the Kazakhs have to climb up the side of a cliff to take the eaglet. 
and they talk to it, they sing to it, and gradually as the eagle grows, um, the man and the eagle become one and the same. And they, usually the females, they grow to about 15 pounds and they take the eagle into the mountains on horseback with them. And the eagle is used to survey the whole area and to capture small foxes, small marmots, sometimes even small baby wolves, and to then bring them back to the gur. So then the family can have meat and to have fur um, to live off of. It's an incredible relationship that has sometimes been compared to almost parent and child. And what's also quite nice to know is at a certain age, the eagles are released back into the wild while they're still of breeding age. So it becomes a very sustainable practice moving forward. So it's an incredible thing to go and witness. And this is what the trip does. So on this trip, we fly from the capital UB, three and a half hours west to the town of Ulgi, which is actually on a different time zone. And there we go into the beautiful Tavern Bogged National Park, which borders China. And it's wild. It's wilder than really most of the places that we go to on the Great Khan trip. And especially as we're there in September, you can see the autumn is still very much kind of you know, coming into play quite quickly. And it is predominantly Kazakh, so you will meet um, ethnic Kazakhs as you're traveling around. It's also home to some UNESCO petroglyphs, some of them dating back over 12,000 years. There's a couple of, and we spend three or four days really getting to grips with this national park. There's a couple of high altitude lakes around 2000 meters, some stunning bird life and opportunities for horse riding to glaciers, walking to waterfalls and really taking in you know, the variety of these landscapes. But then we come back we stop in a Kazakh gur and start to meet with some of the eagle hunters. Um, and there are, it was almost a dying thing. Today, there is considered to be about 400 um, eagle hunters in the region. And you'll learn from them how they use you know, the hood, how they use the gloves in order to teach the eagle um, how to hunt for them. And then you get to the festival. Now, it's worth saying the actual hunting happens in winter. This is a festival in autumn. So there's no real actual hunting, hunting that happens. This is really a display of skills, of performance, and a lot of dressing up looking pretty awesome and showing off. So this is kind of the opening ceremony, the equivalent of, you know, kind of the Olympics where everyone kind of comes in um, and the guys and everyone, they look amazing and they are fully kind of kitted out in their Kazakh gear. They're all coming in with their eagles um, and it's quite an astounding um, thing to see. And then the festival itself really takes off. And generally the, the first part of the festival, you can see here that there is an enclosed area and up top they're on a cliff. And what they do is they take the eagle and they release it from the cliff. And then the trick is for the hunter to call to the eagle while it's in flight and have it, first of all, try and grab a little piece of meat from your hand and then at another stage in the competition to actually be riding and for the eagle to catch up and take something. There's kind of a 50-50 success rate. So it either kind of gets big cheers or kind of hilarious laughter from the locals watching. And it's worth remembering that this is a local event very much so. You know, this isn't something that people see every day and Mongolians will travel across the country to come and see this event. But it's not just about the eagles. You know, the whole festival includes other things. This is one event where at full gallop, the riders will try and pick up coins from the ground and Mongolians really are the most amazing horse riders today that you'll ever find. It's an astounding skill to watch. This is one of my favorite ones. I don't really understand it, but it seems to involve woman with a whip chasing after man and trying to whip man. That's it. That's the competition. But again, very, very popular with locals. Um, and then at the end, there's a big ceremony. People get certificates. And as you can see, it's not just men who are involved. You have women, and there was a documentary made in 2016 about um, a young um, huntress who won the competition, and that has really inspired other girls and young women to get involved and really to, to learn from their, from their fathers and from their grandfathers this incredible tradition. And for our point of view, it's not just about the competition. Like I said, you're mixing there with locals. So there's a chance to, you know, to meet with kids, meet with families. Um, and it's a really nice festival atmosphere um, to enjoy. So that is effectively the second group trip. 
very briefly, option three is a private group. Very easy. You take one of those itineraries and you say, we want to do it, but we don't want to share it with other people. We'll do it with some friends or some family. You pick your date. Obviously, if it's Eagle Festival, you're kind of limited. But other than that, you pretty much got your pick. And unless you're really extreme, please May to September, possibly May to October. The final option is you can go completely tailor made. Obviously, you can take and pick and choose anything from what I've shown you already. And um, we have our travel expert, Clem, who is on hand to help you. And here are just a few ideas um, that might give you a little bit of inspiration. You can go to the Nadam Festival. Now, this happens in July. It happens in the capital, UB, and in some of the provincial cities around there. And here you will see a celebration of what they call the three manly sports, archery, wrestling, and horse riding, which Benedict was already talking about. Yes, you can also go up to the reindeer herdsman in the north um, and meet with the shaman up there. Um, that's not only where uh, Benedict went, but it's also the story of the horse boy, which was a book, but also a film which you may know about. And this is a story of a man by the name of Rupert, whose son was autistic and he'd heard about shaman in northern Mongolia that could help young children with autism. So he took his child up there and it really helped. And that was organized by Tolga. Now, Tolga, who some of you, if you've already traveled with us to Mongolia on our group tours, Tolga is our very dear friend. Tolga did say to me that he might try and tune in. But given the fact that it's pretty much three o'clock in the morning in Ulaanbaatar, um, I think he'll probably be watching it tomorrow. But just to say a lot of the photographs that I've just shown you um, from the Eagle Hunting Festival, especially are Tolga's. And he's a lovely guy. And hello, Tolga, when you're watching this tomorrow. Um, other things which you might want to do, obviously, you can go horse riding. If you're a very bad horse rider like me, you can do a couple of hours. If you love horse riding like Johnny or Benedict, you can do half a day, a day, a week, as long as you want. And it can be rather simple and gentle or it can be as full on as you want. You can do cookery classes. You can go kayaking, you can plant trees, you can study more about the musical instruments, you can learn about Buddhist painting, really whatever you're interested in we can do. And if you really don't want to travel that far from the capital, it's worth knowing that Terelj National Park is about one hour outside the capital. And it's beautiful grassland scenery. And yes, while it may be a little bit busier than some of the other national parks, this isn't busy kind of Bournemouth beach on a sunny day after lockdown. It's busy Mongolia style. So you can still have a wonderful kind of wilderness experience. And on the outskirts of it, you've got that incredible Genghis statue that Johnny was showing you earlier. And finally, you can pick and choose. There are a few select higher level, um, very comfortable properties, such as this one called the Three Camel Lodge, that do add quite an element of class to the whole uh, experience. But really, wherever you are, you're gonna have wonderful kind of night scenes in, as Johnny said, unpolluted skies and some of the most wonderful sunsets ever. So I apologize if I've gone over a little bit, but I will stop sharing and hand back to Johnny. No, that was great, Mark. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we have Benedict back. Mr. Uh, are you? Yes. Are you are back. Back. Hey, okay, fantastic. I'm going to uh, shut up and I'll let you uh, carry on from where you were. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I didn't quite, well, you lost me. The, it's the peril, isn't it, of um, these international things. But here I am in Prague, hanging on, really enjoying Mark's um, scenery and, and enjoying his pronunciation, his Mongolian. Obviously, coming along like anything. Oh, perhaps he's mastered the language. <laughs> um, right. So let's see. Uh, ooh, I don't know if I'm getting my, um, ooh. uh, I'm trying to find my presentation. Uh, Benny, yep. Yeah, uh, um, well, I've seemed to have lost it from on, my... on the bottom there, Benedict, far right bottom is your PowerPoint. You seem to have, yeah. Made... Okay. Thank you. There we go. Yeah, thank you so much. I did try and warn you, or try to warn you about me and technology. This is why I love Mongolia so much, because I can just, I'm free of it. So I can just take my camera, film what I can for the BBC or whatever, and, um, and share photos with you um, and not have to bother with um, things like this. But anyway, um, 
So great. Um, I'm going to be very quick, um, but just to try and uh, get you back into the spirit of the journey I undertook all those years ago, 25 years ago, I was coming out of the Gobi now, very worried about the weather, temperatures are dropping half a degree a day. Um, but I was also worrying about my mental health, frankly, um, <laughs> because I woke up one morning and um, I was munching my muesli, which I ate every morning, and the camels were munching their grass. And I thought, uh oh, I'm munching with exactly the sort of same rhythmic motions of a camel and I was sort of surveying the landscape in the way that a camel does and I thought I spent too long with my camels I've been six weeks with them and now it's time to rejoin my kind and out of the Gobi I strode manfully um, so there I am coming out of the Gobi and the interesting thing was because uh, Mark was saying it's a very interesting thing which is, what, what do you do out in Mongolia it looks like there's, there's, there's so much space and everything. Uh, of course, there are, are so many festivals and so on. But the extraordinary thing is the landscape does overtake you and you feel almost bewitched looking up at these immense blue skies. And coming out of the desert, I, I, instead of feeling relieved, I felt a sadness. I thought I've, I feel at home with the place that I was so scared of at the beginning of my journey. So um, difficult to, to walk 600 or 1,000 miles um, uh, by yourself. Anyway, um, I had adapted to the landscape and it was a wonderful thing. And I think you'll find as you adjust to Mongolian time and the Mongolian rhythm of life, that's nomadic existence, you'll find yourself adapting, stepping away from our hurly-burly um, and into this lovely open space in, in a sort of magical way. Um, anyway, time for me to finish my journey. This is at Zamanut, where the railway that Mark mentioned uh, cuts through Mongolia from China up to Ulaanbaatar. Uh, I didn't actually load my camels on board. But I loaded myself on board, um, said goodbye tearfully to my camels, which have been so brilliant to me. And um, I had, had finished my journey. Uh, I suppose it was five months or so it took from beginning to end. Um, so getting chilly again now, it's starting to be uh, starting to snow, actually. Um, <laughs> but I just want to end um, at least talking about the journey with this photo. Obviously, the Great Wall of China, it's seen as a great Chinese achievement. Of course, it is a great Chinese achievement. But if you think of it another way, this thing was built, this extraordinary wall that goes on and on and on, to keep out a bunch of nomads. And it's, in a way, a great tribute to the Mongolians. They were so powerful that this ginormous structure was built by the Chinese to keep the Mongolians out. So I always rather think of the Mongolians rather than the Chinese when I think of this wall, because it says something about the power of people who were seen, of course, uh, just as simply nomads, but in fact, people who uh, brought the Islamic world to its knees uh, and threatened Europe too. Um, a few years ago, actually only two years ago, I went back to Mongolia after a gap of all those years, 25 years, a generation later, I went back. And I just want to mention this because it's important you don't think I'm just being nostalgic about these journeys. Mongolia has so little changed. There I am, new camel, same old Benedict, um, different scarf actually. Anyway, uh, there was the camels, there were the skies, there was the landscape. I was so pleased um, to see that there was so much that I loved still unchanged. Kermit, he was unchanged. Um, <laughs> he cut down on the drinking slightly. Um, uh, he, he'd actually changed from more of a sort of nomadic horseman to a nomadic taxi driver. But he's still, um, he put on quite a lot of weight actually, but um, anyway, was, uh, I worked on decreasing his weight with a strenuous trek again sort of across Mongolia. Uh, and we had a great time, brilliant to be back with him. And again, that sense of uh, the hospitality of the Mongolians was everywhere to be seen. And I came across all these people that were so good to me last time. This is the bloke who was helping me get hold of Top Camel. Do you remember that camel, the tricky camel that was hiding amongst all the rest? This bloke is the bloke who's the horseman on the right of that photo he's holding. He was so excited that I remembered him. I said, of course I remember you. We had to spend so long trying to get that camel. Um, and uh, anyway, it was a lovely thing to go back to uh, and find him. And it wasn't just him that I found. Um, do you remember I mentioned this girl, Sete uh, It means little flower in Mongolian or something like that. <clears throat> anyway, it, 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 it was the translations, right? It's the Mongolian I'm a bit worried about after all these years. But uh, there she was, this little girl, uh, and she was one with a grandmother who was a shaman. I found her. Uh, I found her. I tracked her down to her uh, encampment amongst the other reindeer herders right up in the far north of Mongolia. And there she was, generation on, with her own uh, child. 
and uh, it was a, a lovely, lovely little moment. I include this not for personal reasons so much as to try and emphasize the fact that Mongolia hasn't uh, changed. Uh, there are still shamans out there inviting Tengur, the sky god, to bless a journey as this shaman did uh, for me on this occasion. And that boy in the back, do you remember that boy, the one that didn't win? Uh, I was worried about him all these years. I don't know why, but he stayed in my mind. I thought, I'm going to try and find him. I don't care about the winner. Um, <laughs> I want to find him about the poor bloke who came second. He's probably forgotten. He's, maybe he's bitter after all this time. I don't know. Anyway, I tracked him down. There he is. And he was so pleased. I wish I, I had nerve to take the first photo of him. I just couldn't do it. I showed him a photo of him riding as a young boy, and he burst into tears. Um, and I said, oh dear, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to upset you. And I didn't take a photo, but it was such a moving moment. He said, that was my best race ever. It didn't matter that I came second. But that was the race that I always remembered because it was my best race. So um, anyway, he's thrilled. He tucked the photo into his Dell. That's a traditional uh, tunic. Um, and he said to his son, you're going to be a horseman one day. So he's got a sort of matching son. Um, and uh, anyway. There we are. It, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing to be reunited, not just with the Mongolians, uh, but uh, with their landscape. And so I entreat you, please go off to Mongolia and um, yeah, get to know it as I did, if you can. Uh, but perhaps just sample this extraordinary land, the hospitality, the horses, the camels and those extraordinary blue skies. Benedict, wow, thank you so much. It was, um, it would have been catastrophic if we hadn't had the ending of all that because it just kind of wraps everything up so nicely. Such a great story and such a, such a yeah, poignant ending, I think. Um, so if you can just stop sharing your screen for a second, Bernard, that's lovely. And I'm going to share mine now. And uh, I'm still on that picture. Um, I realize we have run over a bit, but I don't think, um, hopefully nobody will complain about that considering it's been so entertaining. I've been sitting here uh, thoroughly enjoying it myself. Funnily enough, of the 90 odd destinations Wild Frontiers do, do uh, Mongolia is one of, I think, three countries I've never been to. I was supposed to go in 2020, but of course, COVID put pay to that. I haven't been to Nepal and I haven't been to Sri Lanka, which are two horrible um, holes in my travel CV, hopefully soon. Um, so let me just quickly um, carry on. Whoops, a daisy. Um, so yeah, just a quick bits of information. Do check out Wild Frontiers TV, as well as obviously our proper website. Here you'll see quite a few interesting videos, as well as um, our man, Mr. Benedict Allen in Uzbekistan. You'll find that on the homepage, wildfrontiers.tv. Benedict went to Uzbekistan with us a few years ago and uh, made some lovely little short films, which you can watch there. Um, which leads me on to our next webinar, which is on Wednesday, the 24th of March with the wonderful Caroline Eden, great friend of Wild Frontiers. Caroline's book, Red Sands, has absolutely blown everybody away. Um, she has written, she, she really is, she's kind of, it's interesting, a bit like Benedict made a genre for himself out of kind of travels with my camera, just, just him and a camera and, 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 well, a load of camels in the Mongolia sense. So Caroline has kind of made a name for herself by combining um, journalism, geopolitics and food and travel all in one narrative. And, and this book has been book of the year in so many places, the Sunday Times, the Times, the New York, so it's amazing to have Caroline with us um, at our next webinar. The format will be very similar. I'll do some introductions. Caroline will talk you through her uh, views of Uzbekistan, and then Mark will talk to you about what Wild Frontiers does there. If you'd like to book a tailor-made trip, then please get in touch with one of our travel consultants. They've traveled all over their destinations and know them inside out. They'd be happy to do a Zoom consultation. Um, in normal times, we do these talks um, uh, at the Frontline Club or at the Royal Geographical Society and part of the proceeds from the tickets go towards the Wild Frontiers Foundation. Now obviously we can't do that at the moment um, so we just ask if any of you would like to we would love it if you'd go to the foundation page of our website and a donation no matter how small would be wonderful. We run a school in Pakistan, we run all sorts of different projects, a, a girls football team in Ethiopia, um, some uh, the Pink City rickshaw drivers, that another uh, women's empowerment group in Rajasthan, uh, all sorts of projects we do. So please, if you 
Good, that would be wonderful. Um, we still have reduced deposits, 200 pounds or $250 for our group tours and 10% on tailor-made. And of course, we still have our COVID promise, which is that if any trip can't go for COVID related reasons, you would get a refund or a free transfer. Um, the group tours, maximum group size 12, uh, tour leaders and local guides, interesting comfortable accommodation and transport, as you've seen Mark describe here from Mongolia, uh, full board, almost all meals included, uh, COVID health and safety protocols in line with the World Tourism Council, tailor-made travel, full team of travel experts in the UK and US and expert knowledge of their areas, and we are at all protected. So I think we've got time for a couple of quick uh, questions. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to go to, uh, let's go to gallery view, why not? Uh, so Benedict, if you want to bring your picture back, because um, there's a really nice question that I want to ask you because it, it, you, you kind of semi-answered it, but um, it's from Julie and she says, you've traveled a few times on camels now. You seem very forgiving of their quirky characteristics on your journeys. It, is it hard to say goodbye to the animals when you've been through such experiences together? Yes, um, it's yes, <laughs> it is. Camels are so misunderstood. I think people imagine they're grumpy and they are in a way, uh, but you sort of can't blame them because they, they are great survival machines. They, they know the landscape. They don't want to be bothered with strangers. They don't want to be bothered with things that are decreases decrease their chance of survival. So they're difficult to get to know sometimes and they're very powerful animals. They can kick you in all sorts of directions and so on. But they are extraordinary animals, not just because they have physical power, but because um, they are very, very affectionate and very, very loyal if they trust you. If they trust you to, to lead them and look after them, um, they'll treat you as a sort of honorary camel. And it's very, very hard. I, I was fortunate, um, although I worked quite hard on this, to give my camels a good home at the end of the journey. And uh, yeah, it was um, it, it's just very, very sad uh, to say goodbye to them, but lovely to go back two years ago and make new camel friends. Great, yes. Um, I've got a question for you, Benedict. You kind of semi-answered it with what you said about Mongolia, but you know, recently you've made almost a kind of a genre within a genre of your travel reporting by returning to places that you first visited many, many years ago. I believe you've been back to the Amazon. We know, obviously, you've been back to Mongolia. And of course, you're twice now, I think, returned to Papua New Guinea. What I'm kind of interested to know is, I wonder what are the things that strike you the most about the change in that kind of generational time period of, of what, what strikes you? Or, or is there not, not much? I mean, like you say, in Mongolia, there really isn't much. Is that true of other places? Or, or has modern technology and Twitter and all these things kind of interrupted those lives in the way that they probably yes. are. Yes, it's, it's dangerous to generalise, but I think, I, I'm, I suppose I was expecting huge changes in all of these places, whether it's the Amazon, Papua New Guinea or Mongolia. Um, we expect it because our lives are changing. We're so used to now having a phone. It's difficult to imagine 10 or 15 years ago or whatever it was that, where we didn't. Um, and we, we, and of course, there are mobile phones all over Mongolia, for example, or in the Amazon and so on. Um, so there are these changes, but you sort of expect those. What I found, I suppose, above all, I think it's quite heartening, is the resilience of these cultures. Uh, uh, I specialise in living with indigenous people. I'm thinking of very small ethnic groups, for example, in the Amazon and Papua New Guinea. And my feeling had always been, well, they're, they're doomed as a people, as a, their cultures are going, they're dissipating. And there is an erosion of uh, certainly the habitats, the environment, um, and of their, the cultural norms. They're less tight, perhaps, as communities. But they're still there. And they, in the Amazon, for example, there were great advances. The Matses, who I lived with, known as the Jaguar people, because they had the Jaguars as a role model, they were fully in, in command of their forests. They had pushed out all the settlers, the drug dealers, the loggers. So, a great story there. And again, in Papua New Guinea, I found people that I thought were doomed and I, whose cultures and families I thought would all be swallowed up by the outside world. I found them again thriving. Um, and again, in Mongolia, I heard a huge number of stories about mining concerns and so on. But I still saw that pride in the Mongolians. Ulaanbaatar has changed beyond recognition. There's no doubt about it. I think its population is three times the amount of when I first went in 1997. But um, 
get out among uh, out of Ulaanbaatar or into the countryside, and still there's that pride. And um, Mark, I'm sure, would agree. Uh, extraordinary, this hospitality. It's still there. Still that. It, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to hear. I mean, I, I think my um, kind of connection with that is the Kalash people of northern Pakistan. And I, I remember back in the mid 90s when I was being told they'll be gone in 10 years and they're absolutely not. They're, they're, they're there and as proud and as, uh, as, as focused on their cultures and, and religion as they ever have been. So that's good to hear. Good to hear, Benedict. Um, Mark, I've got a couple of practical questions for you. You didn't talk quite enough about food, particularly for vegetarians. Um, what, 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 what options are there? <laughs> Benedict, stop <coughs> laughing. <laughs> I mean, traditional food, nothing. I mean, well, vegetarian-wise, sorry, not vegan. Vegetarian-wise, yes, there are cheese products, but outside of traditional food, everywhere that accommodates um, foreign visitors knows that generally they don't want a diet like Benedict Hagg's kind of, you know, crossing, you know, just of mutton, whatever. So you will always find, you know, um, there'll be bread, there'll be rice, there'll be vegetables. A lot of it is imported because not a lot of it can be grown in the country, um, but you'll be absolutely fine. Like I said, the only ones that would really struggle would be vegans, I think, would struggle a little bit, but would survive. Uh, but no, vegetarians, we have a lot of people that travel there. Again, you're not going to come away saying, oh, my God, what a gastronomic delight, but you'll be absolutely fine. Yeah, I was going to say, we've had plenty of vegetarians go there. Um, another question for you, Mark. Uh, two or three people have asked this, uh, Jason and I think Jean. Um, if you don't want to fly, how can you get there? Train. Yeah. Oh, how do you get from train, what, for, from, from Euston um, all the way? <laughs> well, I don't think you have to go through the literal kind of, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, generally, if you don't want to fly, then I said the, the main points are from Moscow or from Beijing are, are, are the two main hubs for the Trans-Mongolia. So um, it's very difficult to try and enter from Kazakhstan. Um, but those are ways of, of getting there. But it is, you know, depending on where you're coming from, it is a long way. But it is possible to go all the way overland from Europe to Mongolia by train if you really want to. I'm just remembering we actually had a couple, didn't we, who took uh, the train to Central Asia and the train back from Central Asia, having done two of our trips in Central Asia. So, yep. so we managed to do it. Uh, Benedict, a uh, couple of questions for you here. Um, did you carry food and water for the camels? Oh, good, very good point. Um, it was, I'd love to say the, it was carefree, this, this the journey across the Gobi, uh, but I was always terrified. Perhaps I've read too many accounts as a little boy of people crawling on their hands and knees um, uh, saying water, water. So I was always worried about my own water, uh, but also water obviously for the camels. Um, I would take, you saw it almost in one, one picture, uh, milk churns uh, with spare water sealed in them. Um, that was mainly for myself, but as a reserve for the for the camels as well. The camels could walk, um, well, it's best to give them water every other day if you can. That keeps up their strength. Uh, water every, certainly three or four days is advisable. Um, you, they can go, well, the whole winter without uh, water, but in the winter they're, they're not, they're not, what they're not marching along and they're not in heat uh so it, 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 it's a complicated question but i did i just had to zigzag between wells that i the military told me about and various nomads told me about uh food i didn't take um because they were i'd have to stop and they'd graze till it got dark every day uh, and then they'd, they'd sit down and they first light they come up and graze again um so there was enough grazing but um I had to choose my route quite carefully. One other question which I like because I remember on my, well, on a couple of my journeys, I've had to become an expert at taking photographs of myself. And this is long before selfies uh, and, and uh, uh, SLR cameras where you have to put it on timer and run back into the shot. Now, there were a couple of beautiful shots, particularly the one of the flowers in the foreground and, the, and you riding past. Somebody's asked, how did you take photographs of yourself? Um, self-timer, it, it was the, the days of self-timer. Um, I'm trying to think if there were any photographs there by Agent Arbib, uh, 
he is a professional photographer and twice he did a mammoth expedition to find me out in the Gobi and uh. north in Mongolia. And he took a whole lot of photos of me, um, uh, which we used for the TV series as well as the book. Um, but generally, no, it was, it was the old fashioned SLR uh, with the self timer and me trudging by and then thinking, well, oh, I think we made a mess of that one. And the trouble is the cameras were always making a mess of the photos. They, their heads can do strange things. They sort of swing around their head and look, look the right way. Um, but we got lucky with that one. Um, I, yeah, it was just trying my best. Um, bearing in mind the journey was, I think, five and a half months. That's a long time if you're taking photographs. So you hope that one at least is, is gonna come out. Right, you know. Yes, I mean, I'm imagining you've also got quite a big stock of, because this is before when you can film an entire show on a piece of plastic that big, you were recording on lots of tape, presumably. Yeah, on on little cassettes. I think yeah. it's, it's high eight, it was, a little cassettes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, um, yeah, the cameras would roll on them and crunch them up and yeah. Yeah, it's a nightmare. Yeah. Different, different world. Um, guys, I think a lot of the other questions are, are questions that we can pretty easily answer uh, by email. And I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that it's already 7.30 and we've kind of gone on a bit. Um, but it has been absolutely fantastic. It's been an absolute pleasure, Benedict, to have you um, with us tonight and tell us about your incredible adventure. Um, thank you so much. I'm sorry we lost you for a little bit in the middle there, um, but uh, never mind about that. Great to get you back and to give us the fulfillment of the trip, which was so nice to hear. Um, so Benedict, thank you so much. Mark, thank you. And above all, thank you to everyone for watching. It's been uh, great to have so many people right until the end. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.